thank you, Scott. So I'd also like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak here. Uh, please feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Uh, you know, targeted therapy is, is really a huge topic. I'll try to do it justice. I guess the only thing I can say about that is a lot of it is similar and a little bit redundant. So here we go. Okay. So I think I really chose to put this as systemic therapy because I think that's really what we're talking about. You know, in a sense, uh, what can we use to treat the cancer wherever it is in the body? And so I think there are probably three major categories. There is immunotherapy, uh, there's the angiogenic pathway, and then there's the mTOR pathway. I'm, I'm mainly going to talk about the bottom two because Scott's going to cover the immunotherapy next. So this is, again, a cartoon which depicts staging in kidney cancer. And really, when we're talking about systemic therapy, it's what we use here. We have tried to use it here, but so far, you know, it's, it's not really shown success in that particular area, that is stage three. Um, then again, you know, Scott's gone over this. So really what we're talking about is, you know, about 30% no, to 30% of patients at presentation have metastatic disease. And these are the ones who are the targets for systemic therapy. Uh, I, I think when we say estimated median survival 10 to 12 months, that's not always true. I mean, you know, stage four is not one broad brush. And again, I think it's important. That's the average statistic, but especially with therapies these days, that's probably not true. And I think we have a much, much more to offer. Again, I think this slide's been shown, uh, you know, multiple times as well. And the main point I want to make here is most of the therapies that we have are really optimized or probably worse, work best in clear cell, which is 75% of kidney cancers. And all the other subtypes, you know, I think therapy is still evolving, and we are not quite sure how best to treat the other subtypes of kidney cancer. So going back to the systemic therapies, uh, I just have a couple of slides on immunotherapy and primarily on IL-2. You know, this has been around for a long, long time. And, I, you know, again, there are IL-2 believers and they're non-believers. I definitely fall in the believer group. And the main reason is this study which led to the approval of IL-2. And I've kind of highlighted here, here on the next slide. So I think this, the main point here is in people who do respond, you know, median survival is usually in years. So I think the downside is it only works in about 10 to 20 percent of people, but in the folks whom it is right for, and it's not right for everybody, and in whom it works, it's, you know, it's time limited, you're done in three to six months, and you can get very, very long and durable responses. I think the onus on us is to find out who are the people who, who are going to respond to that, and hopefully with some of the work being done, you know, here at the university, maybe, you know, three, four, five years from now, we'd be better able to define that subset of patients. Okay, so moving on to the, the VHL pathway or the von Hippel-Lindau pathway in, in kidney cancer. So VHL gene product, essentially what it does is it keeps down <coughs> levels of hypoxia-inducible factor or HIF on alpha. So if the VHL gene product is missing, there's upregulation of this hypoxia-inducing factor, and once that goes up, a host of other growth factors are upregulated, you know, leading to growth of the tumor. And this is kind of depicted here. So the, the, the main one here is really VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor. And if this is upregulated, you know, Basically, cells can survive better, they can grow better, they can migrate, and that in turn triggers off many other pathways, which basically, you know, keeps on fueling kidney cancer. So a lot of therapy in kidney cancer, and again, clear cell kidney cancer, has been focused on how do we downregulate VEGF. Now, this is a complex system, and this kind of just depicts the complexity. So there are three receptors, one, two, and three, and there are at least eight or nine different ligands. And again, as time goes on, 
these only keep on increasing. And again, the drugs that we have, you know, they probably target some of these pathways and not all. And remember, I'm only talking about VEGF, there's PDGF, there's EGF, there are, there are many, many other growth factors. So it's a, so it is targeted therapy, but it's kind of more drone-like. It's not that specific, and there's a lot of collateral damage. So that's the big challenge in using agents to target this pathway. Uh, so some of the things that have been done to target the VEGF pathway is you can have antibodies that, you know, that, that, that wipe out the ligand. So this is Avastin or Bevacizumab. Or you can target the receptor, or you can target, uh, you know, the, the, the signaling modules of the receptor inside the cell. So that's why there are multiple different drugs available that target the VEGF pathway. We don't quite understand why some work better than others. And again, it probably has to do with which particular pathway is operative in a particular person. And even though if you block that, then since there's so much of redundancy in this pathway, the other pathways take over. And that's why I think this is extremely complex. And again, remember, I'm only talking about VEGF. There's PDGF, there's FGF. There are multiple different growth factors which fuel kidney cancer. Uh, the other pathway which has also, you know, garnered a lot of attention is the mTOR pathway. And then once again, if you see this, uh, you know, it, it also interacts with HIP1 alpha. And so the other line of investigation has been can you combine drugs and can you block multiple pathways? And so far that's not been very successful. So anyway, these are the diff different approved targeted therapies for kidney cancer as of today. So on the VEGF side, you have sunitinib, you have serafinib, you have pisobinib, you have bevacizumab, and you have excitinib. So at least as of today, these are the approved anti-VEGF agents. And again, it's not pure anti-VEGF. As you can see, there are multiple other things or other pathways that inhibit. And then on the right-hand side are the two mTOR pathway inhibitors. There's temsorolimus or Toracel and avrolimus or Finitor. So at least so far, this is the list that we have which is approved. <coughs> now, the first one to be approved was serafinib. Uh, next was sunitinib. And really in front line today, the three most commonly used are sunitinib, pisobinib, and bevacizumab. And I think this is also becoming, even, you know, this is also started being used in, in front line. But the, the, currently the three approved are, in, in first line is, is sunitinib, pisobinib, and bevacizumab, not alone, but in, in, in combination with interferon. And then in poor risk patients, uh, temsorolimus is approved in first line. So the other targeted therapy I forgot to mention, I think is extremely important, is surgery. I mean, when you have somebody presenting with this big of a tumor, all the drugs that I showed you, you know, in the previous slide are not going to do anything much. So again, I think we shouldn't forget surgery is an extremely targeted therapy, important targeted therapy, even in metastatic disease. So I think if we kind of had a question as to somebody presents with a fairly big kidney tumor, would the options be observation, nephrectomy, systemic therapy, or BNC? I mean, I think, you know, most of us, at least, even on the medic medical oncologist would say it has to be BNC because, you know, the, the systemic therapy that we have today is not good enough to do anything much for big tumors. And in fact, every time I see a patient who has a big kidney tumor where surgery is not an option, I'm actually always very nervous. Okay. I, I think the other big thing which helps us decide, you know, who do we give what are, are different risk models that we have developed. So in 1999, Memorial Sloan Kettering came up with this one, and 10 years later, uh, a consortium based out of Alberta and Canada called the Henk criteria came out with those, and they're really very similar. And the important, you know, the important points on this are the time from diagnosis to systemic therapy. So in other words, the shorter the period between diagnosis uh, and needing therapy, 
you know, that that's a bad sign. A poor performance status or a compromised performance status, elevated calcium, uh, elevated LDH, or anemia. So these are all validated factors which, uh, you know, which basically help us prognosticate how somebody's going to do. And on the hang criteria on the right, they have a couple of additional things. And basically, the important point here is if patients at presentation have none of those factors, so that means a risk factor of zero, they're in a favorable group. If they have one to two risk factors, it's an intermediate risk group. And if they have more than three, then they're in the high risk group. And I think both the memorial criteria as well as hang criteria are actually, you know, have predictably shown that, you know, the more the number of risk factors, you know, the poorer the prognosis. So here it speaks to two-year survival. So in other words, you know, in the high-risk category or the poor-risk category, that is more than three risk factors, the two-year survival is 3%, and in the favorable group, it's almost 50%. So again, this is just a guideline at the time of diagnosis or when you want to start to treat somebody which can help you substratify patients and, you know, be able to advise them on what to do or what not to do. So this is a little bit more on the HENG criteria. Again, you know, th this is more recent, so they have more factors at the disposal. Plus, there's been stage migration. We pick up patients earlier. So with the zero risk factor group, median survival is about 43 months, 23 months, and for the poor risk group, it's eight months. The, I think the other thing the Alberta Consortium did was they actually also looked at non-clear cell kidney cancer. You know, we say kidney cancer, but really most of what we talk about applies to clear cell. So for the non-clear cell, you know, as we predict, the prognosis is slightly worse for each of those risk groups. So 34, 32 months in the good risk group, uh, 16 months in the intermediate risk group, and then five months in the poor risk group. So I think if you kind of see where the landscape of kidney cancer you know, stands today, uh, most of the progress has really been in the last decade. So, you know, so prior to 2004, we had interleukin-2, which was good, but worked in a very small subset of patients. Uh, interferon alpha, which has always been controversial, but has been the control arm for all studies. Again, I think it works, but probably not very effective. And then between 2004 and 2012, there were the other six drugs which we already talked about that were approved. So I thought what I'd do is I'd just kind of walk you through, you know, some of the important studies which kind of led to the approval of agents in this particular category. So I think for, for the first line, I picked sunitinib, which I, I think most of us, for most of us, that is first line for clear cell kidney cancer. So. This is the study that led to the approval of about 700 patients either randomized to sunitinib or to interferon alpha. So sunitinib is typically given on a four weeks on, two weeks off schedule, and interferon alpha is administered thrice a week subcutaneously, continuously. And again, if you, so the first thing to look at is the response rates, you know, about 46% and 12%. Uh, complete response, almost non-existent, 1%. So most of the responses we see are really partial response or stable disease. Now, again, I think the devil is always in the details. So if you go with the resist criteria, if you treat somebody and if the response is less than 30% reduction in tumor burden, that is still stable disease. And if the tumor grows and if the, and if the growth is less than 20%, it's still stable disease. So really stable disease is, you know, a 25% change roughly on either side. And again, if you see, the majority of responses are either stable disease or partial response. And they are, you know, almost zero complete responses. So I think, again, you know, it, it's a little controversial, but I think different people do things differently. When to start treating somebody in kidney cancer again, is a little controversial, and again, I'm talking about metastatic disease. So if you have somebody with very low disease burden, uh, I think it's always hard to commit them to lifelong therapy, because essentially, once somebody starts on this treatment, 
you know, they're going to be on this till they progress. Because the majority of what you see is partial response and stable disease. You don't really take them off. So at least personally, I, I like to follow patients. And if they clearly have progressive disease, you know, I think that's when you initiate systemic therapy. Because, uh, again, and, you know, like about 10, 15 years ago, we didn't have a whole lot of options for kidney cancer other than surgery or IL-2. And if patients progressed despite IL-2, if we just followed them, you know, very often they'd just be in this stable phase where the, um, the disease would hit a plateau and they wouldn't get growth. So at least personally, I don't like to start somebody on systemic therapy when they're in the plateau phase. So this was the, you know, the, the progression pre survival, 11 months on the sunitinib arm and five months on the interferon arm. And in most of these studies, I think survival is always a difficult thing to follow. And the reason for that is, you know, we assume after a phase three study that nothing else is going to impact survival, but the truth is with so many different treatments available, uh, you know, people see other things and it's, it's hard to see a survival difference just given the multiple different agents that are available. Now, again, if you split the patients up based on, you know, the, the good risk group, the intermediate risk group, and the poor risk group, again, median survival can be very different, 14 months, 10 months, 3.7 months. And the other important point here is, again, you know, it can vary. It's 11 to 16, 8 to 10, 2 to 10. So, so I think the biggest challenge with targeted therapy, you know, other than the fact that one is committing a patient to it forever, is the host of side effects. So if you look at all grades, you know, it's almost anywhere from 20 to 50%. But fortunately, grade three and four tend to be less than 10%. Now, I think th there's a certain commonality in the side effects that you see with targeted therapy. So fatigue is common to almost all of them. Uh, GI side effects, you know, diarrhea, nausea, stomatitis is again very common. Hypertension is common. Uh, you know, skin rashes, hand foot syndrome, stomatitis, those are again very common. Now, it doesn't matter which drug you pick from the category. I think these three or four things, the fatigue, the hypertension, the, the skin toxicity, the GI toxicity, is, is pretty common to all of them. But, you know, with one, you'll get a little more of the other. And again, there's also patient-to-patient -patient variation. Uh, and then, you know, then there are also side effects peculiar to different drugs, like for sunitinib, about 10% of patients will have a decrement in their cardiac ejection fraction. I think this is the slide I was looking for earlier. So remember the progression-free survival, there was a big difference between sunitinib and interferon, but when you actually look at overall survival, it's about 26 months in the sunitinib arm and uh, 21, 23 months in the interferon arm. So again, sorry, 22 months in the interferon arm. So, and that's probably largely a reflection of patients getting exposed to other drugs. So the other one I picked was stem serolimus. So remember, sunitinib is approved for first line in good risk and intermediate risk patients. And for poor risk patients, uh, stem serolimus is approved. And the study that led to the approval was as follows. So either there was interferon alone, stem serolimus alone, or the combination. And this was probably one of the first studies which looked at combining two different drugs. And here again, um, you know, overall survival was about 10.9 months and progression-free survival was 3.8 months. And the combination arm was not better than temsorolimus alone. So remember, sunitinib is an anti-VEGF and temsorolimus is an anti-MTOR. Again, if you look at the adverse events, very similar, all grades, fatigue, asthenia is about 50%. This has a higher incidence of skin rash and, and mucositis, but then also nausea, edema, and again, some of the GI side effects. But once again, you know, fortunately, when you look at grade three and four, you know, those are the ones that we worry about more, it goes down substantially. But again, I think we can't get away from the fact, if you look at all grades, 
it's anywhere from 20 to 50 percent, no matter which category you look in. And again, the major categories are skin toxicity, fatigue, GI, and hypertension. So this is just a snapshot of the different anti-VEGF agents you know, that are either approved or are used, either in first or second line. So sunitinib progression phase survival is 11 months in first line. If somebody has failed cytokines, meaning IL-2, it's about eight months. Serafinib is about six months. Pasobinib is about nine months. And exitinib is about 15 months. And I think probably exitinib is primarily used in second line, but you know, some people have wound up using it in first line just given the, you know, the, the fairly significant uh, progression-free survival here. So how do we sequence these agents? I, I think first line there is consensus, but second line there is confusion. So in the first line, and again, this is controversial, I think in the right person, I probably would still recommend Hydro's IL-2. And again, the reason is, you know, if, if you do respond, the remissions are probably the most durable that we know of any drug. Secondly, it's time limited. And I think that's actually a very important thing. But then, the, on, on the con side, high dose IL-2 is not for everybody. You know, you have to have an excellent performance status, you know, normal stress test, normal pulmonary function test. So there's a fairly rigorous thing to go through before you qualify for that. But again, in the appropriate patient, I do think that should be first line for the reasons we discussed. I guess for the majority of patients uh, who are in the good or intermediate risk category, either of these three is okay. You know, you can either use sunitinib or pasobinib, or if there's a problem with oral coverage, bevacizumab and interferon is not a bad thing to try. But I think most of us would either use sunitinib or pasobinib. Uh, if somebody is poor risk, then I think you can either use sunitinib or I guess most of us use, would use temsorolimus. Now, temsorolimus is, is intravenous and this is oral. Once somebody has failed VEGF, you know, it used to be avrolimus, which is an mTOR inhibitor, which is second line, but a lot of people also use exitinib. Uh, I, I guess a more cynical view here is it's also kind of driven by insurance. So pasobinib and Everolimus are both Novartis products. Sunitinib and Exitinib are Pfizer products. And you know, more and more, you kind of run into when you ask for approval, depending on you know, who has a deal with whom, uh, very often now I get this, have you tried Exitinib before you can try Everolimus? But I think it's really driven by insurance. But I don't think either is an unreasonable thing to do, because the truth is, you know, so somebody gets an anti-VEGF, or let's say sunitinib, they fail, they go to an mTOR, they fail, they go to another anti-VEGF. So whether it is sunitinib, evrolimus, exitinib, or whether it's sunitinib, exitinib, evrolimus, I honestly don't think it makes a big difference. So then there's also third line. I mean, I know serafinib is here in second line. Remember, this was the first oral TKI that was approved. Uh, so once somebody has failed sunitinib and neurolimus, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to try this. I, I, you know, in the setting of a, I mean, obviously if there's a clinical trial available, you know, that would be terrific, but in the absence of that, I, I think serafinib is, is reasonable. Now obviously the other big thing that is emerging are, are the immunotherapies, which Scott's gonna talk about next. So people have also looked at combinations, and here are just you know, a snapshot of some studies. There, there's been temsorolimus and bevacizumab. There's been avrolimus and bevacizumab, and then there have been these combinations. And as you can see, there's no difference, and there are more side effects. So at least at present, uh, there is really no approved combination. I mean, patients always ask this, but can I just take it? And I think it's important to remember, this is not something you try at home. Okay. Having said that, you know, this year at the oncology meeting, this is probably the first trial that was reported where a combination may have promise. And this used a drug, you know, levantinib, which is an anti-VEGF. 
uh, in combination with Everolimus. Now, the big difference between this and sunitinib is, so remember we've been talking about VEGF, PDJFR, and if you look at their activity, so the smaller the number, the more active the drug. So if you look at sunitinib, it really has no, or, or seratinib, they have very little impact on the FGFR pathway. And this drug actually has a fairly good impact on the FGFR pathway, in addition to VEGF and PDGFR. And, and this was the design of the study. There was levantinib plus Evrolimus. So this is an anti-VEGF, anti-FGF, and Evrolimus is an mTOR, anti-mTOR. So there was a combination, then levantinib alone and Evrolimus alone. And at least if you look at the initial data, but the numbers are small, 50 patients in each group, the progression-free survival for the combination was 14.6 months. For levantinib alone, it was seven, and for Evrolimus alone, it was five and a half. So again, I think it's early data. It's only 50 patients per group, but this is probably the first combination, uh, you know, hitting three to four different pathways, the VEGF, PDGF, FGF, and mTOR, uh, which gave a fairly meaningful improvement, in, at least in progression-free survival in this small group of patients. And I, sorry, I don't have the toxicity data here, but the side effects were not overwhelming. They were the same stuff, you know, the skin rashes and the hypertension and the, uh, you know, the, the, the mouth toxicity and hypertension, but they were no more than what you see with sunitinib alone or prosopinib alone. But remember, it's a fairly small subgroup of patients. It's only 50 patients, and that's not enough to kind of make a categorical statement. Now, I think Scott's going to talk about this. The other combinations that are going to be tested are all the oral targeted therapies we talked about with a bunch of the new immunotherapy agents or the checkpoint inhibitors. Finally, the other, I think the other important thing that also came up during this oncology meeting was this is the first trial which has been completed in non-clear cell kidney cancer. So everything we have so far is primarily for clear cell. So this is the first one that was completed in non-clear cell, and they compared Evrolimus, which is an mTOR inhibitor, and sunitinib, which is an anti-VEGF. And for the longest time, we have believed that at least in the non-clear cells, the mTORs may be better. But again, it tells you till you test this, you don't really know. Here, if you see, sunitinib actually had a better progression-free survival compared to Evrolimus. It was a little counterintuitive. And so, at least even for non-clear cell kidney cancer, I think, uh, the, you know, uh, the current recommendations are that sunitinib prolongs survival in both good and intermediate risk over and above Evrolimus. Now, the group where Evrolimus was probably more efficacious was in people with a poor performance status or the poor risk category, again, going back to the, the way how we characterize patients, and also in the chromophobe subtype. So if somebody is good or intermediate prognosis and they don't have chromophobe, all those non-clear cells, you know, sunitinib ought to be the first line. So I, I, you know, kind of began by saying that, you know, in the, so all the systemic therapies that we have, whether they be first line, second line, or third line, are really for stage four kidney cancer. There's been a lot of effort expended in stage three, the idea there being that if you could use some, one of these drugs in high-risk kidney cancer, perhaps you can prevent stage four from happening soon. There's been a huge amount of effort expended on that. Uh, recently, the first trial, which was about 1,800 patients, was reported on. And there's actually no difference in survival between the placebo arm, the sunitinib arm, or the seratinib arm. So at least as of now, we really have you know, we, we, we don't have anything proven to offer in this space. So I think I'll stop there and be happy to take questions or like.